Welcome to the podcast, Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. As I may have mentioned before on this podcast, I am currently writing a new large history of Byzantium, and it's been taking me many years. In the course of writing it, I discuss it with colleagues and friends, editors, and the question often comes up, what kind of a history is it uh, in terms of what audience is it going to address? Uh, is it going to be technical for experts primarily, uh, or for a general audience, uh, or, yes, <laughs> a textbook. Um, so it's not a textbook, at least not in the way in which the commercial industry of textbooks imagines them. Um, and I always say I'm trying to pitch it um, somewhere between um, experts and a general audience in the sense that it will have new arguments that uh, professional historians will be interested in and will want to consider, but at the same time, it will all be written in a way that the, quote, average intelligent reader will be able to follow. Now, let me say that this is not easy to do, and there are always pitfalls on either side of that equation. You can you can write what you think is accessible, but it turns out that it's not. Uh, you're taking for granted too much uh, from your audience. Also, when some people think popular uh, history, they imagine something really, really dumbed down uh, that that focuses on on some sensational um, events and uh, omits a great deal of sort of socioeconomic analysis. So this actually points to a tension um, in the work that historians do, which is that on the one hand, we all recognize the imperative to, in a sense, educate the public about what we're doing. That is, we're, we're producing knowledge and new interpretations of history that we hope, in some way that we often don't give much thought to, that it's just going to be disseminated out there somehow to the public. So we're just going to write the books and publish them, and they'll go into libraries and Somehow or other, the ideas contained in them, if if they are of general relevance, I'm not talking about hyper-specialized work, will somehow percolate into the general knowledge sphere. Um, at the same time, we're also teaching students. Uh, so many of us can believe that via our teaching, we are promoting the mission of disseminating new knowledge to the public in some limited way initially, but perhaps over time it might compound. Now, now, let me say that this is a situation that is more distinctive of straight historical research and certainly of like philological or literary study. Uh, there are adjacent fields that have different means and different dynamic when it comes to this question. So, for example, uh, art history or uh, the study of uh, music history. So by the nature of the media that they study, they have opportunities to uh, disseminate their interpretations to the public uh, in in other ways via exhibitions or performances um, and, and the like. Today we're going to be talking about what historians face um, in particular. And the situation that I described a moment ago, that is the distinction between writing a specialized monograph or a popularizing book that your colleagues will say, oh, you wrote one of those, <laughs> you know, um, well, good for you. I hope you made some money from it. Maybe you can send one of your kids to college. Uh, yeah, you don't make that much money from those. Um, but, you know, now, now you'll get back to serious work. So that was a distinction that applied really during the 20th century. In the 21st century, we have all of these new media um, that were surrounded in or swamped by sometimes it, it feels like uh, by which to not just disseminate ideas but create broader conversations and cultivate networks of constituents that might also be not just consumers but also but donors when it comes to funding academic work. So I wanted to have a discussion about where we stand in relation to all the new media and how we might or even ought to or should take advantage of them in order to disseminate academic knowledge to a broader public, however um, our new media can capture that public. And I could think of no better person than Merle Eisenberg. Merle is a researcher at the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center at the University of Maryland. 
Now, just in the past few years, Merle has attained um, a remarkable position in a number of conversations uh, that are taking place, both in academic, strictly academic circles, but also moving beyond them. And so let me just list them here, just to get a sense of uh, the, the different fields that he straddles. So, so Merle does primary research in two main areas. Um, this is uh, the fifth century Gaul, so post-Roman Empire um, West, or sort of early medieval or late Roman, post-Roman, call it what you will, you know, things like bishops, councils, and, and all of that. Also, a separate strand of research um, that I've made great use of on the Justinianic plague in the 6th century. Most of the evidence for that is either Eastern or technical scientific, like in the lab. And that's an area of research whose findings he has sought to disseminate more broadly to like the media. And he also has a podcast with Lee Mordecai uh, called Infectious Historians. I recommended it before um, on this podcast, and I recommend it again, uh, which is on disease and health um, throughout history and its representation. Um, and so I thought, correctly as it turned out, that he would be an ideal person to speak uh, with about uh, the opportunities provided by new media, how we access them, and what sorts of stories uh, we can tell uh, through them, because every type of medium has its limitations as well as its advantages. As always, my thanks to Medievalist.net for uh, reposting this podcast. Here, then, is my conversation with Merle. Merle Eisenberg, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Anthony. So I thought that you would be an ideal guest for this topic because, well, you and I are both podcasters in a way, right? So we're doing what we can to popularize um, our esoteric knowledge and make what's going on in our respective fields more accessible to the public and so on. By the way, um, for my audience, if you haven't checked out Merle's um, podcast, this is the Infectious Historians uh, with uh, Lee Mordecai. Um, do so. I have a link on the uh, on my podcast uh, website, um, and it's about you know plagues and medicine and uh, throughout history, and uh, with lots of interesting uh, side topics like uh, pandemics and film and things like that. It's a really great episode. So the topic today is you know how you know we who work in academia or who at least publish specialized research can or should disseminate our uh, insights and our findings to the general public. What are the means by which we do this? And what is our responsibility in that regard? And what are the kinds of problems that can uh, emerge when we do that? Uh, so let's start very briefly by separating out what we think of as scholarly work versus popularizing. So what counts as popularizing work uh, for us? And I, I suppose by that, we mean anything other than a peer-reviewed article or a monograph or something like that. But there's outside of that, there's such a vast range of options. So, um, you know, why don't, why don't you tell us what, uh, what those are? Sure. So I think, you know, to set the groundwork, and these are going to obviously be gross generalizations at first, but if you separate popular and scholarly work as perhaps two different spheres, the popular work tends to quote unquote, not count as much, right? That's the underlying problem of much of this. So the incentives for each person to do some more popular work are particularly low, right? So you're incentivized to essentially write your dissertation, turn that dissertation into some type of book, usually one or two more narrow books. And then from there, when you're maybe a more established uh, middle or senior academic, you then write something more popular. So if you want to think about it, you're writing to maybe 10 or 15 people in the beginning, and then you broaden outward uh, from there. And, you know, as I say, the tension here is that for promotion, for tenure, for, I guess we might say respect or chops, for lack of a better term, in your field, uh, it's the academic work that's almost always going to do it for you, right? So there's less of an incentive to speak to a broader audience. Now, I think there's exceptions to that, right? You, Anthony, have published quite a bit and you've gone back and forth in many of your publications. But, you know, you could also ask, what is the incentive to start a podcast? So why did you start this podcast in particular? I mean, I'm curious about that. 
the primary reason was to disseminate the good work being done by colleagues in the field to a broader audience, because I was feeling that the way we publish, while a good way of publishing for those who you know are experts in the field is not necessarily serving a wider audience. And I, I imagine that each of these episodes get about 2000 downloads that I can count. Um, I don't know how many you know circulate outside of you know the counters. Um, is far more than any academic monograph ever gets. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's right, and I think perhaps the underlying irony of of the separation between quote unquote popular and scholarly work is that obviously where we live and how we think is very much part of how we're raised, right? So to use just one example that I always think about, right? I work on plagues and pandemics you know, how we think about late antique and medieval plagues and pandemics, I've suggested is actually very much shaped by what we think about and what we read today, right? So the most obvious is how many people were sitting there and reading Camus the plague during the midst of COVID, right? And how much is that going to shape both how you think about the past and how you think about today? Um, some people are more explicit about this and, and some people are less, but I think they're very much tied together and they're really one in the same project in my mind. Yeah, so what are, other than podcasts, what are some other ways of popularizing scholarly work? Yeah, so I think there's no single answer to this, right? I mean, podcasts are one format that I think are obviously become increasingly common. But, you know, one thing I always used to do, I guess pre-COVID now, is I used to walk into the Barnes & Noble down the street from my parents, um, you know, every few months when I would visit them and see what kind of books were there, right? So in the late antique and medieval and Byzantine field, you would basically get, uh, there's a few books on the fall of Rome you would find. And for Byzantium, I'm sorry to say, it would always be uh, the short version of Norwich's Norwich. history. Um, that's about the only things you would find. Now, one way to do this, which is the most classic way, is to write more popularizing books on the fall of Rome or on Byzantium, these types of topics. Um, but I think there's kind of, I've thought more and more about this. There's two other writing formats we might think of. One, I think, which is particularly important, which is something you've done a lot of, is translations, right? You, you know, I don't, I've never tracked this. I wonder if you have, but if you uh, look for a translation of a work, right, suddenly someone translates the work and it's right afterwards, everyone's working on the topic. Just That's right. By chance. Oh, I can talk about that at length. <laughs> You know, in my field, I, I, I specialize on, on early medieval, late antique uh, southern France. And so these sermons of Caesarius of Arles, there's over 200 of them were translated uh, in the 50s. And all of a sudden you saw a massive increase in who's using them. Um, the other type that I've become particularly into, I guess one could say, um, are graphic histories. I don't know if you've read any of these. Um, there's one on Perpetua um, that you, you can like assign. a graphic novel? Yes, but they're graphic histories. Um, you mean a because... comic book, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say graphic histories because aside from Perpetua, there's one which I will very much support by a scholar named Michael Van um, called The Great Hanoi Rat Hunt. And when I told him uh, it was a graphic novel or a comic book, he, he, he gently berated me for a solid two minutes right. of my own podcast. Um, but... You know, this is a wonderful book, um, not least of which is based on an academic article, um, which came out in a journal. And what he actually found was it was being cited by economics textbooks and actually was in history textbooks of India, like K to 12 textbooks, as an example of uh, actually what's called perverse incentives. Um, it's a story, yeah. make a long story short, of rats getting their tails chopped off and people realizing that you could get money for rats with their tails chopped off. And so you just grew rats and then chopped off their tails. Oh, I know, so I know a great, uh, there's a great joke in Greece that goes around. I think I learned it in the army, which is that, so the um, the dictator of uh, Greece, uh, Metaxas in the thirties, and he goes on a state visit to Bulgaria and he sees that Bulgaria has all these forests. <laughs> you know, and Greece is, you know, you know what Greece is like. And he asked the king of Bulgaria, how can you keep all of these forests? What, what did you do? And he said, oh, I just shot all the goats. <laughs> And so Metaxas comes back to Greece and he says, and, you know, it offers a price for the head of every goat that's brought to him. And so everybody started breeding goats. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's, that's the exact story that he finds out with what's happening in, in Hanoi uh, at the turn of the 20th century. 
And and why I like this book, aside from it being just a wonderful story, is Mike actually explains economics, colonialism, and actually Michel Foucault better than I'd ever actually seen explained in very simple terms. And so I think that's a really wonderful way to reach to reach a very broad audience. Right. Now, so I did an episode on a graph, what did you, graphic history? Graphic um, history. Of Theophano, a Byzantine empress of the 10th century. It was a few episodes ago, but it was done by two... Um, you know, young artists who were not academics. So is Van a specialist in the area that he wrote that in? Yeah, he's a historian mm -hmm. of colonial Vietnam. Then he teamed up with an artist, an artist. the artist that's yeah. often used for a lot of these series through Oxford. Um, right. But it's a really good resource. I mean, I... So, yeah, I mean, if you're a professional, you know, historian of that period and you, you write a, you, you know, you make the decision to use that medium, it's going to be stimulating and thought provoking and so on. But then on the other hand, you have something like, you know, the 300. Yes. Right. <laughs> so um, I, and I think the difference between those two, uh, perhaps is a good argument for why academics should get involved in that medium. So as not to cede it to those who will populate Greek history with zombie ninjas. Yeah, no, I think that's a good case, right? I mean, there's a lot of skills, you know, I, I don't think Mike uh, was, he did a lot of background research, he told us, right? He read tons and tons of these graphic novels and graphic histories, so he really shaped what he wanted the final product to look like himself. And I think that's, you know, a skill set to pick up. That's a skill set, you know, we can we can talk about, there's a little bit of mechanics to this, right? Just as learning how to do a podcast has a certain mechanical skill set to it, whether it be by a nice microphone or learning how to use editing software, but it can be learned, you know, with not that much trouble, certainly no more trouble than picking up a new language for a pre-modernist. Oh, much less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, by the way, I want to um, amplify what you said about translations, because um, I've done a lot and they really don't count, just like you said. And I never expected them to count. It's not like, like I'm not complaining here that oh, I did all these translations and never counted. I knew from the beginning that the structure of academic promotions and tenure and so on, they, those things are, oh, that, that's very nice, pat on the head, you know, good for you, you did that, but we're not gonna count that as the sort of meat and potatoes of your scholarly production that we are evaluating. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure someone has done a history of this because as far as I can tell, there's a history of everything. But it reminds me very much of, uh, you know, modernists don't get credit if they visit eight archives in five countries, right? They often say this as, you know, showing their own chops, but this, you know, it's a process, right? And so I think translations are slotted far too frequently into a process rather than an outcome, perhaps. So here's another problem. There is, in some corners of the academic world, an incentive to write an inaccessible way. So, I mean, let's not forget that, right? While we might be trying to pull scholars into more popular media, there are countervailing pressures that push us to make our work accessible to smaller and smaller groups by using jargon and theories and so on. A lot of which is unnecessary, right? I mean, we don't need to go over all of that now. Uh, but I think that a, an argument can be made that maybe scholars should start by making their work, their scholarly work more accessible. And I, you mentioned a moment ago, you know, popular books on the fall of the Roman empire. And I remember when I read Peter Heather's, you know, the, was the fall of the Roman empire, what, what? I, I, I was very impressed. Now you can agree or disagree with any parts of his argument or whatever, but I was very impressed. There was a very accessible book that I think sold quite well that nevertheless advanced a scholarly argument that the field has had to deal with, uh, you know, one way or another. Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually the perfect book. I should say that's the book that you'll find in Barnes and Noble always. And, you know, that book for me has a lot of uh, personal background, both because I did my master's degree with Peter Heather, um, but also because oh. I didn't actually know the first time I read it, who he was arguing with. Right. Right. And where it was situated in the historiography, because he wears that very, very lightly yeah. in very uh, straightforward writing. And I completely agree with you. Now, knowing the arguments back and forth, knowing where, when that was written, how it was written, there's a lot of background to that that I now know. But I do believe if you write more simply, that is a really useful trait. 
one thing that I've always found, and this is my own personal work, which I didn't actually set out to do, is I co-write quite a bit, um, both with my co-host, Lee Mordecai, and, and with a few other people uh, in the field. And what I've found is the more I write with other people, the clearer my writing is, right? Because all mm -hmm. of the complex thoughts, ideas, theory, right, we might say, if someone else hasn't read it, it doesn't make that much sense to them. And so most of that gets stripped out pretty quickly. And so that's been an interesting way forward. Now, again, co-writing in our field in the humanities is also considered a weird thing. Right. And that's something that's often not value, right? What happens if you co-write a book? Well, what does that count for? Right. right. That's like a, a debatable question. Um, it, it, it is. And it, it is another one of these tensions that pull our fields apart. So just as we have the idea that, yeah, we should be educating the public. Uh, we're not going to do that. In fact, we're going to use a lot of jargon laden prose. In the same way, you know, we keep talking about, well, we should be interdisciplinary and collaborate more. But when we do that, it's like, well, who really wrote this book, right? Like, oh, I, I'm not sure I can credit it to you. Yeah, I've actually gotten that question several times in different places. Yeah. You know, and I also think that I work at a center that's mostly natural scientists, ecologists, hydrologists, some social scientists, you know, and what they think of what interdisciplinary means is very different than what you and I think, right? When I, when I talk to historians, right, if I say I do interdisciplinary work, they're like, oh, so you read some anthropology, right. or you read some sociology, or maybe you delve in some literary studies, right? That's not at all what anyone I work with would consider inter interdisciplinary, because that's all within the humanities. What they mean is crossing some of those bigger, usually school divides, as it were. And so that's a very, very different word um, as well. I've also argued that saying interdisciplinary is just, you know, window dressing on stuff, but that's me. Yeah, up. no, often it is. And you're exactly right. And for, for in our corner, it usually means with someone in another department, but in the same college. Yeah, it would be, you know, I'm a, I'm a late antique historian in the history department and you're in the classics department. And so exactly. we, we talked once about how you are more of literary and I'm more historical. And so we can both understand source X. Yeah, yeah. And so there is a danger that if we don't take the initiative to try to make our ideas accessible to a broader public, um, others who are not experts uh, will do so. And, and many do. Um, I think the, the temptation and in, in many, many people to just write a, a grand narrative of something that they once excited them when they were in school or something like that, and they retire and like, I'm going to write a new history of whatever. And and, you know, they're not very successful books. <laughs> I mean, just reading them as an expert. Yeah, but they're incredibly successful because they tell a good story, right? right. Are, are you are you on Twitter? I can't remember. No, 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 no Twitter. Prob probably a good thing or not. But, you know, there, there's kind of two complaints on Twitter that I've seen in the last, repeatedly in the last year, right? And I'll just give you two examples. One is during covid humanities people are constantly complaining that they don't have a seat at the table for decision making and ideas. Now, no one understands what that would mean or how to get that, um, but there's constant uh, complaint and hand wringing, we might say. The other one, which is more specific, is there was this uh, article, and then I think it's a book that came out last year on uh, the weird uh, countries. Have you seen this? Weird countries? Yeah, weird in capitals. It means uh, Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So this is okay. a someone going through large data sets to basically point out that the West is inherently essentially better than everywhere else and more developed. It sounds and like a Stanford thing. It's it's a Harvard thing. So, you Harvard, know, same okay. thing. <laughs> But the, there's various points, but the, the main issue they give is that Western societies don't marry each other, right? After about the year 500, that they're no longer uh, basically having cousin marriages. So a breakdown of Roman kingship, so the nuclear families become the way forward. Uh, now, this is obviously a deeply problematic idea, also deeply Western-centric, uh, it doesn't quite work. But what they use for their data is they go into church councils that talk about banning incest uh, from the West, and they gather all the church councils as if to say the church councils, what they decree in about the year 500 then becomes normative in all of Western Europe moving forward. Um, this is obviously completely nonsensical, but you can see how this would be an appealing uh, story to tell. 
And so I see. Yes. The problem becomes how do we this got massive news coverage, massive uh, interest. So how do we get to the point where we also get more interest and more news coverage in our own work? Is what so I this say. spread via Twitter? This is where I saw all the anger. Um, now, this spread via multiple news outlets, right? They all reported on this. It got People got angry about it a couple of weeks ago, again, because someone published a Financial Times article about how this was like one of the books of the year and explained all of Western civilization. Was it written by academics? It was written by like a neuroscience person. Um, well, okay. So isn't this a warning about the dangers of... It? So, so this is also what, um, I don't want to say troubles me, but... It, it is a persistent danger that, you know, academics with access to data and the drive to produce a simple narrative. And so you use all of your resources and all of this data and you come up with a simplistic, but kind of, you know, sophisticated sounding narrative and it spreads through all of the social media and, and you know, news outlets and whatever. If we can agree that, you know, it is incumbent on us to disseminate knowledge and academic theories broadly, how, how do we avoid that kind of problem? Yeah, so I think stories are important, right? I mean, you do have to give some kind of broad answer because that's ultimately, you know, on one level, you and I have to teach things, right? So you can't teach, ah, this is a very complicated thing, right? right? And so, you know, very cool stories will take hold, right? So, you know, what is the the classic story of 11th century Byzantium, such as I remember the classic story, is, you know, this civil and military fight. Right. Now, it turns out that this is pretty nonsensical when you deconstruct the narrative, but what's the new story of the 11th century? I mean, you have to replace it with something. So deconstruction, as someone who's done a lot of deconstruction in their career already, only takes you so far. And, and I really do believe that. I mean, you've written a new history of the 11th century, so I presume you have a better story of the 11th century that you then teach. Yeah, it's not two sentences long, like the old military and civilian, you know, polarity, but but it it's it's almost a page long. Like I could condense it into that. It's a, it is a bit more complex, but you're exactly right. So this is another structural problem that we face, that our instincts um, as scholars are to uh, complicate things, sometimes unnecessarily. I think our, our bias would be to make things more complicated than they need to be, but also the way in which academic one-upmanship sometimes works is always to say, well, it's more nuanced than that. Well, it's more complicated than that. And right. And so you, you, you can start with a basic story that may be, you know, more or less true or, or just false or whatever, and just nuance it so much that in the end, it's just a, just a soup of flying words that no one can make any sense out of. Yeah, no. Right. I mean, this goes back to the, the age old splitters versus lumpers way, right? Do you split all your arguments down to as many sizes as possible or do you try to make sense of the available data you have and make something out of it? And I think as we're taught, right, we're very much taught in really graduate education to basically rip apart other people's arguments, right? I mean, that's, that's the way a graduate seminar works. Like go pull out the footnotes and show and beat the person to death with it. And I, and I think there's, needs to be more attention given to the mechanics of uh, telling the story you want to tell and telling a neat uh, package, you know, and figuring out how to take your complex story. So I bet there is a way if you took your one page 11th century story and you went to a, you know, a PR marketing person and say, could, could you make this into one sentence? They could probably do it for you. Now you might not be completely happy with the outcome, but I bet they could. I mean, that's their job. So I would think so. Right. But I wouldn't want it to be disseminated that way this is another fundamental tension here because I understand the uh, power of a simple narrative. Uh, it's a dialectical process. In other words, the, the, the simple narrative emanating from, from scholars who want to present a thesis like that at some point, you know, interfaces and interacts with an, with a public, a broader public. I would like the public to be a little bit more discerning about the consumption of these kinds of arguments. So for example, just a very, very simple thing. If you see an argument that is purporting to explain why the modern West is wealthier, 
and has bigger armies and bigger economies and better universities and whatever, better healthcare systems. And the answer that you give has nothing whatever to do with colonialism, never mentions it, never talks about conquest, appropriation of properties, you know, subjugation and enslavement. If, if those things are not part of the story, it's not a credible story. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with your with your point, right? You have to be able to uh, mix and match the two, because if you don't, then you end up with a one line answer that essentially, on its face, won't hold up in five years, let alone be believed by people, nor make sense. Yeah, I mean, it just can't be despotic Persians fighting freedom loving Spartans like you saw in 300 like it, that's that's simply too simplistic and I, I would never want to be part of an enterprise that reduces history to something quite like that though Twitter seems to be fine with it yeah that's why I said it's probably a good thing you remain off Twitter because it's where all nuance goes to die as far as I can tell right I mean because you you can't see the other person's face so Right. I'm an extremely sarcastic human being. That's no. just how I was raised. <laughs> and so you can't do sarcasm on Twitter. So I have to be, uh, in many ways on Twitter, I'm a very vanilla person because I know most of the things I want to say would probably actually make people angrier just because they don't know me well enough to know what I'm trying to get at. So I'm a very late adopter when it comes to technologies. And um, and there's some that, I, you know, I waited many years and podcasts, uh, after years, I decided are a good medium. Uh, whereas things like smartphones and Twitter, well, no. So smartphones, I'm on still on the fence about. I don't have one. Still waiting to see how that plays out. <laughs> so how do you listen to podcasts if you don't have a smartphone? I download them to an iPod. Interesting. So you're like, you're like my parents when they listen to podcasts. They mm -hmm. take the they take their computer and they put it in the middle of the table and they listen to podcasts. No, over no, I have an iPod. It it it's smaller than those quote unquote phones that people carry around. But for things like Twitter and Facebook, I've decided they're just evil. Like I, I've never heard reporting about Twitter and Facebook that that wasn't like a bad story somehow. Anyway, yeah, I would say the one, not the one, but one redeeming quality of Twitter has been during. The pandemic it is some sense of a community that right. as all of us are at home sure, sure that maybe you can interact with a few more people yeah so from the standpoint of humanity scholars so we we've, we've talked about some of our options we can do podcasting i, I personally think that works I, i've derived a great deal of pleasure and just satisfaction uh, from it a, um, a lot of um, audience responses that you know make me feel connected um via email that's sufficient for me um there are uh, you know, these graphic novel options. Um, and there are also um, books apparently with streamlined simplified theses that you can promote through uh, news channels and so forth. So what are the options on the scientific side of things for, for promoting esoteric research? Because, you know, those are the kinds of options that hum humanists have or historians. What do people in the hard sciences do that we don't? There's a lot of things I used to think about the hard sciences before I worked with a lot of the quote unquote hard scientists. And the thing I've come to realize more than anything else in the last year and a half or so is that some of them are terrific at communicating their work. Most of them are not, right? They're not any better uh, than you or I or any other humanities scholar. They don't talk to the media necessarily. They don't promote their work. They're very happy doing their own niche thing. You know, I can't, I've tried to read some papers in some fields and they are filled with just as much jargon as, yeah. as any, any history paper. But what they do have that actually helps them a lot is infrastructure in place. And by this, I mean uh, people who specialize in uh, communications and working with um, them to get their work out, right? So people who help them write press releases to uh, newspapers, to journals, they have particular journal uh, articles that work with them. So you have science writes its own kind of uh, articles based on their own work that then gets disseminated uh, quite strongly. So what they do have is an infrastructure to back them up that I think we don't have in the humanities. 
Bro, what is a press release? So a press release is when you write an article, you condense down your article into about a page, right? You have quotes from the main authors in a the scientific or humanities journal. Um, and then you disseminate that to the press. You usually upload it to a website three or four days before the article goes online so that uh, various news outlets can find them. They can then write an article. And so when the embargo lifts at a particular time and date, I mean, this is a big difference. So a science article, it will have an embargo date. So it'll say, this article is coming out 3 p.m. on Monday, and you can start writing about this at that point. Now, what that means is you prep the press release and you send it out to people beforehand, say four or five days before, and so they can literally have the article come out at 301. And this is exactly what happened. We wrote an article for a science publication called The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It was a history article in a science journal. And we had various news outlets contact us in the days running up to it. We gave them more quotes, talked to them about the article, and then at 301, magically, a CNN article just suddenly appeared. Um, and that obviously took off at that point. Wait, wait, let me get this straight. There is there, there's a centralized online database from which all or at least many or most of the main news outlets, they go there and just kind of trawl through the press releases that people have posted and pick the ones that they're going to run with? Yeah, that's one way to do it. The other way is you can, if you've worked with press before, so let's say I had published, I had published an article, someone had written this article for CNN, I would then perhaps have their email and I could tip them off beforehand and say, hey, I have this other article coming out. Do you want to write about it again? Um, and they will either say yes or no. Okay. But yeah, there's a centralized repository. Essentially, you upload the press release and then people will draw from that. I mean, our civilization being what it is, what's preventing thousands of trolls from just uploading whatever, you know, maniacal garbage they come up with? So this is the other main difference with the sciences and the humanities, which is money, right? Oh. So you have to pay ah, okay. to upload. So it's not a lot of money, but you do have to pay something, right? So most trolls are not like, hey, I'm going to spend whatever it is, say $100 to just put up a fake press release in the hope that someone might run with my story about cats eating dogs down the street and turning into zombies. I don't um, know. I don't know. It's bold words because 2020 is not over yet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but I mean, the money situation is also comparatively different, right? I mean, that's the other issue, sure. which is we don't pay as humanities people to publish our articles, right? But the back end means that you have to basically be part of a library, essentially be a practicing academic to have access to those articles if you don't right. want to pay like $15 an article. The science is, it's all open access, right? For the most part, but you do have to pay thousands of dollars sometimes to get articles published. Right. Yeah, we, we don't have, I'm sorry, speaking as a classicist, let's say, or a Byzantinist, we don't use that infrastructure. And I don't even know what would happen if I put up a press release, like for a book of mine or whatever that's about to come out and just kind of see if anybody runs with it. Why, why don't we do that more often? We don't do it more often because no one's trained to do this, right? I mean, I'm, I'm telling you what this is and you're I'm walking you through very preliminary steps, but it's not obvious, right? It's not right. hard to do, right? Making up, when you do a press release, you essentially make up fake quotes for all the author. The author said this, the author said that, but you're just writing them. I wrote them all for our press release, right? So it's a skill set that most people aren't even aware of, let alone having, right? So it's not hard to pick up, right? If you, you're writing a book now, presumably, because you seem to write a lot of books, um, which I'm always very impressed. And so for your next book, you could do this. Because the other way to do it is you also form relationships with particular press people, right? So you build yourself, uh, since you're an old-fashioned technology person, you build yourself a Rolodex, right? Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> I will, I, would, I will mail them in the, in the physical mail. I will mail them my press release. I mean, mine, you know, I have a, a, a Google Sheets, right, of Go various um, <laughs> various uh, media outlets and 
people who work there and what they've written on. And so you see, oh, this person likes to write about uh, history articles, let's say. So maybe the next time you write something, you can send them an email and say, hey, do you want to write about my history article? Well, okay. You know, I'm totally going to do that because I'm writing a new history of Byzantium and it'll be big, um, but I think it's accessible. Uh, accessible. I will totally do that. I'll see if the people at my press, that is academic press that will publish the book, have any contacts at the kinds of press outlets that is newspapers and news sites and so forth. Yeah, I mean, you can also, oh, I, you can also do this yourself, right? In the sense of you must read online publications that you like, right? right? Presumably, I love The Atlantic, for example, right? So sure, sure. you can find people's emails in various ways and just reach out to them. I mean, they get flooded with this information constantly, but it's yeah, something yeah. I think that, you know, humanity scholars should do more of. Yeah, I'll check the Maoist International or something. So. <laughs> I'm joking, maybe. No, I think I'd be good at that. I mean, I think I can condense things down to a page and and I'm very good at making up quotes. I do that all the time in my monograph. So, <laughs> so and, and yeah, no, I was just going to say the importance is getting your name and your work out there because then you never know who's going to come calling, right? So I was randomly on CNN International at the beginning of March and did like a four and a half minute segment with them because they had read some quotes I had given in, in some work I'd done. I saw that. You were wearing a suit. Yeah, so I have, I used to, so part of the reason why I know how to do this, I used to work on Capitol Hill in DC. That's how I learned the skill set, as it were and oh, learned that it was a thing. And I also happen to have like six suits because you just have to wear them. Yeah, it looked like a business political type suit, not an academic suit. You know, you have to be more ruffled to for academic uh, street cred. So, okay, so you did this for an article of yours. Um, what was the response? Like what, 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 outcomes did you see that were different from the usual? So there was a good and there was a bad response, right? The positive response is that more people read at least of the article, whether or not they read the article, I don't know. But it was picked up in, I think, over 90 newspaper, you know, magazine outlets, media outlets, broadly speaking. Um, it was certainly talked about a bunch on Twitter. And at least in terms of the number counts on the website, I mean, those were astronomically higher than any history website. We're talking, you know, in the tens of thousands, at least of views. Wow. Obviously significantly higher than, yeah. than a normal thing. So again, whether or not everyone read the article, got the nuance, everyone was certainly aware of it. Um, there's a downside to this, which is everyone was aware of it. So if you disagree with my position, then there's a take of, oh, these people are just doing this for the publicity, blah, 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 the usual response in kind um, to not liking well, the story. Okay. I mean, I don't know about the argument of you're doing it for the publicity. I mean, that that's a, I mean, clearly there's no gain in it for you really. I mean, you're not paid for these kinds of, are you paid when you appear on CNN? I have no idea. Not at that capacity. No. no. If, you, if you're like on there as a regular contributor, yes, right. I mean, there's sure, sure. critiques of many of those regular contributors because they don't contribute anything. But that's a different discussion. Yeah. So I can't see just gaining publicity in itself to be a particular problem. And for me, it would be almost horrific. Like I, I don't, I don't want to be in the spotlight or anything. But I can maybe I can reformulate the critics' approach in the following way: that. In a, in a context of an established debate where we all kind of know the rules, like we publish these specialized articles, we respond to each other in footnotes and conferences and back and forth and, until some kind of consensus view emerges among scholars, you're kind of jumping the gun and going to the public with uh, a narrative that you're promoting uh, among people who are not, let's say, credentialed, right, to evaluate and assess how you're using evidence, whether the argument is 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 cogent and so forth. And so you're adding this extra dimension to a scholarly debate that's difficult enough, you know, for people, for anybody, even for experts to, to, to participate in it. And you're just adding a new kind of uh, weapon to the arsenal of, of, of competition of ideas. And it's like, you know, the rest of us aren't equipped. We, we, you know, we haven't been congressmen or whatever you were. Um, no. I was not a congressman. Just oh, yeah, so yeah. Cool. I mean, we haven't, you know, we don't have that kind of experience. Like I, I just revealed that I had no idea about this database where you upload a press release. I just don't know how this works. So I'm seeing you as 
almost like doing an end run, not an end run around the scholarly field because it's a scholarly argument. You published it legit and so forth. So it will be part of the debate and it is, right? But you're like, at, you're bringing in all these other people into, into this debate. Shouldn't we like sort it out first among ourselves, let the dust settle, and then everybody can report on the state of the field with, you know, more, do you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I completely see what that argument is. I would say, first of all, that argument assumes that there's a difference between the scholarly and the public field, right? This goes back to what we talked about at the opening, which is, is there really a difference? And I would say there isn't, right? It's all of one spectrum to an extent. It's just how the scholarly people evaluate what you should and shouldn't do. The second thing, which I think is more substantive is, when is a debate ever resolved though? Like when are academics ever really happy about some of these big picture questions, right? I mean, small, you know, when is this work written? Who wrote it? Those works and those debates might be resolved. But for, you know, these big questions, right? And this article was about plague in the end of the Roman Empire, quote right. unquote. Is that debate ever going to be resolved? I don't mean resolved as in like, here is the definitive correct solution. Uh, but so your article was about the impact of the Justinianic plague. Um, and that happens to be a very sort of hot ongoing debate right now. So there are, uh, you know, there are positions or maximalists, minimalists or people in the middle and all of that. And I think that the debate ha has picked up in the past, right, like three or four years uh, to an extent that it had never e existed before. I mean, there were a few pioneers like a long time ago who, you know, did, a, did some articles and we were all like, oh, plague, that, how interesting, you know, you know. Um, but now it's sort of picking up. And I think that we're bringing more systematic um, focus on, you know, methodologies and how we interpret the sources. And I think, hey, you know, I could be completely wrong, but I imagine that in another three or four years, it's not that there's going to be some sort of, you know, consensus agreement, but at least the, the, the different positions will be clarified more, the kinds of arguments that they um, use will be clearer so that it will be possible at that time, say for someone like myself, and I'm, let's just assume that just for the sake of argument that I'm that I don't have a stake in this debate one way or another, I can come in and survey it and say, okay, well, here's kind of the lay of the land. Here's what it looks like without having CNN, you know, having established some, you know what I mean? Like once, once one of these narratives get out there, I, I don't know. What does that mean? Yeah. I'll give you two responses then. And I understand where you're coming from and I don't disagree to an extent, but what I'll say is this, a lot of this work, at least in this subfield, um, is done by paleogeneticists, right? That is to say, people who work on the remains of uh, people who've died in the past and they test them in various ways to figure out what they died of. Um, they're trying to find out if they died of plague, essentially. Yeah. And those people's articles, because of this science infrastructure that's built up and because of their funding structures, and because of ways they already know how to approach it, as I described, their articles are getting the press as well, right? And so right. in some ways, it's a, it's a response to that, and it's within that same playing field. And the other thing I'll say that I find perhaps more depressing is many of these arguments that we're having today about the Justinianic plague have been hashed out over the last 125 years, and there was a resolution reached. And then people just forgot about the debate 50 years later and picked it back up. As Wait, if it what, never what was the previous resolution? Uh, it has, it's about certain elements. So was there plague in England, right? This oh, was a I debate see. for uh, about 75 years. What did rats have to do with this? This was a debate for about 50 years. What's the relevance of climate? That was a debate for about 100 years. And so in some ways, they resolve temporarily and then they just pick back up and really it becomes people forget earlier generations of these debates. Right. And so this is a good point that you made that because your article straddles the sort of humanities historical side and the scientific side, that an argument can be made, and yeah, you just made it, um, that your, your sort of press release approach was stemming or linked to or not unusual in the context of the hard scientific aspect of it. 
Yeah, it also has to do in that article in particular, but also our work more broadly is, you know, how you and I think about sources is very different, right? If I said, here are my sources to a someone, a natural scientist, they would say, what do you mean sources? Do you mean data? Right. Tell me about your data. Yeah. Right. Everything has to be datafied. And so it's nice if we can push back on that and say, no, actually you have to consider all these individual sources. But, you know, if you, if, if I said, you know, I think you need to take Procopius of Caesarea and read him in his context, they would look at me and say, what are you talking about? Exactly. Right. Give me all your sources, line them up and tell me what they say. Right. Right. And so no amount of me convincing them how to close read something is going to convince them just as if you gave us large data sets, your first inclination or my first inclination is to go into the data set and say, let me just chop it to bits, right? Exactly. Because it probably has problems with it. Yes. That a lot of zeros all lined up amount to zero. <laughs> right. So no matter what, there's going to be this kind of tension here that has to be resolved in some way. Yeah. I've had this debate, um, by the way, in a, a committee I was on briefly um, here at the university on research misconduct. And I found that there was just an unbridgeable gap between, you know, the fields I was representing in that committee and the the scientific fields, because they kept, they, they couldn't get over the fact that when I publish an article in, you know, wherever, I don't have spreadsheets of data that, that are not being published that back up the argument. And I kept saying, no, no, every, all the evidence that you need to prove or disprove the argument is in the article. There's nothing I'm holding, I don't have any data that I'm not, you know, that I could fudge. I can't fudge Procopius. I can't do that. Right. And I look, okay. You know, maybe, you know, if I invent a papyrus or something like that, but I mean, that's like one, one in a century of, we, we have those kinds of scandals. Right. And there was total incomprehension about this. It was understood that no, you, you know, research misconduct is fudging your data. And I'm like, how do I do that? Like, teach me. How can I do that? And it was just, it was just not possible. Anyway. But that's yeah, it. I mean, it goes to one thing I think more and more about how I think of myself as a historian, right? In a very meta broad level, but it's to be able to speak to both of those groups in their own language to hopefully be able to make them work together. It doesn't mean that they have to agree. It doesn't mean that they're ever going to resolve the issue you just raised, but at least I can speak both languages that I can be, as it were, a translator between the two. Yeah. Yeah. So while we were speaking, I just came up with a, an argument in, in favor of the press release approach um, that, that, you know, what your strategy, what, what you did with regard to the article, and that is, it's the following. I, I don't think that the, the broader public, let's say, is that easily influenceable. That is its basic ideas. I don't think about history are actually going to budge much. And nah, I don't. I mean, don't ask me why I'm saying that, but just an example. Like, take the concept of the fall of the Roman Empire. After what now? Almost fifty years of historians like overwhelmingly problematizing that concept. I don't see that it's budged at all in the. Uh, you know, public's sort of consciousness of history. It's still, you know, the barbarians in the fall of the Roman Empire, and that's that's dominant, and it's not going away. So I, I'm not sure that, that that much can be done. But by publicizing the article in that way, you're doing a, more of a service to the field in the sense that you're actually drawing attention to the debates. Like, look, there's an actual debate going on about, say, the extent of the Justinianic plague. And here are the kinds of uh, these are the kinds of evidence that we have and the kinds of arguments that we're using. You're drawing attention to this debate in a way that the rest of the field isn't. And I, I think that's positive. Yeah, I mean, I would say anything that gets historians back to the table is a positive, right? And again, I do my own sub-sub field work that I really enjoy on nothing this controversial whatsoever. But when it comes to things like this, I think you do have to get a seat at the table, as it were put it, you know, bluntly. I mean, you're probably going to not like this, but another way to do this to an extent is through film. And that has its own series of problems, I would say. But 
it's about using film, which is an art, I would say, and using that as, as a way to put forward some of your ideas is, is a possibility. So you mentioned film uh, earlier. So what do you mean by film? Presumably, I mean, I'm still waiting for the movie rights <laughs> from my books to be sold. Uh, but until that happens, presumably you're, you don't mean Hollywood blockbusters. What do you mean? So film is an art, right? It's literature. Um, if you want to boil it down to its, you know, real roots. And it's obviously a spectrum here, right? So uh, something like The Hurt Locker uh, is more artistic than, and I'm probably going to get in trouble, so I apologize for the angry emails you're about to get, but The Mandalorian is, is not good art, right? If you watch The Mandalorian at all. Um, I've seen a bit of, enough to know what it is. Okay. I have a great debate with a friend of mine about, I think it's not a very good show. No, I think it's, it's like a Western type thing, but set in space, right? Yeah. I mean, anytime your main character is named Mando and he's the Mandalorian, it's a, anyway, this is a longer discussion. I don't want you to get angry emails because Star Wars fans are very vocal. Um, but what I would say is that film is not about getting it historically accurate in the past. That's not how I would approach it. And that's not how I teach it when I teach it right? It's about the 20th and 21st century stories in the modern context. That's what really matters. It's about how we think today and how that shapes how we write stories of the past, which actually is exactly what historians do at the end of the day, right? The histories we all write are influenced by where we live. I'll give you an example that I always use that uh, probably you've seen. So I imagine you've seen Gladiator, uh, yes. the Russell Crowe film, right? So what bothers me most about the movie Gladiator out of anything in that movie, it's not a very good movie, is that they have stirrups. Oh, do they? I don't remember. Remember, it's 20 years old now. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's a scene, the opening battle scene, they're riding through the trees yeah, and yeah, they, all, yeah. they all have stirrups. It drives me absolutely up the wall because stirrups weren't there yet, right? They're, they're four centuries off. Right. And that makes a difference if you think about military history, vis -vis, you know, lots of things. But so they have stirrups. It makes no sense. This drives me nuts. But what movie do they actually not have stirrups in is the movie Alexander. The, uh, yes. The really bad one. I mean, that's the like really a bad, bad one. Yes. But they don't have stirrups. So as a history accuracy, it's a better film. But that's just me nitpicking. Why do I like Gladiator? Well, you... Gladiator is based on a film from uh, the early 60s called The Fall of the Roman Empire, yes. uh, which is a very famous film. Yeah, yeah. And, and Alec Guinness, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I always show clips of this in class, um, both of them. And what's the clip I show is the scene in which Marcus Aurelius is sitting with Maximus and saying, what is Rome? Right? Yes, from Herodian. Yeah. And so, but if you look at the message in those two films, they've completely changed what it is. Oh, right? yes. What is it? Say. So in the fall of the Roman Empire, it's very much a, all the nations of the world, all the races of the world will all come together and fight off, you know, the evil people in the East, right? There's obviously a Cold War film, right. um, but it also has a somewhat of a civil rights message in there. And if you look at it in the movie, in the movie Gladiator, it's all a movie about the corruption of Rome, right? Because this is a late 90s movie about how awful right. the you know, Senate is, yeah, 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 yeah. the Congress of the United States. So the movie itself is really just a kind of a lame adaptation of that. But what it does is it changes the message of, of what Rome is, which is obviously the United States in the film. And so that changes how people are thinking about you know, Rome, how people think about the United States. And so that's one way in which you can actually change attitudes. That's why I like film to an extent. Oh, I see. Yeah, I was a bit annoyed uh, when I saw Gladiator for a completely different reason. I don't remember noticing the stirrups. But so the character of Maximus is based on um, Pompeianus in Herodian, mostly. Now, he's a compound of a couple of figures, but it's mostly him. Um, and so he's this general. He's this Roman from Antioch. And he's with Marcus Aurelius. He's Marcus Aurelius' uh, top general. He's married to his daughter, um, advised Commodus. He, and he was actually a survivor. He, ma he actually managed to make it through all of those reigns uh, without losing his head or anything like that. And he's the guy who, in Herodian, utters the famous phrase, Rome is wherever the emperor is. You don't have to go back to the city. Commodus is going to stay here and whatever. And it annoyed me. That, and this is that they made him a Spaniard. <laughs> Why? First of all, 
because that's just a racist trope about Spaniards. Like, like Spaniards are in like Northern European imagination, these revenge driven people. Like in The Princess Bride, you you killed my father once prepared to die. Like it's a Spaniard means he's some sort of passionate killer, vengeance driven guy. And they cut out the Eastern Greek speaking Roman, which is my pet thing. <laughs> so, yeah, but again, yeah. you'd have to explore. And the interesting question is, why did they make that change? I don't remember what his character is off the top of my head in the first version, right? In the fall yeah, of the Roman remember. Empire. Yeah. But why would you make someone Spanish, essentially, or a Spaniard? Is this have to do with people have no concept that there's a Roman Empire in the East anymore? You know, by yeah, the I year don't 2000? So. I, that's not fleshed out in film. Yeah. But, you know, these are questions, right? And and so it's not about being historically accurate in that sense, but it's it's how we tell the stories, right? And how those stories change for us. And I think that if you track those stories, there is a change there, even if, you know, they still get the fall of the Roman Empire wrong, right? Suddenly Rome falls in 180. I mean, it's obviously it right, makes no sense. Right. But in a sense, it changes what we think about Rome and how people are telling stories about Rome, that it is capturing within as it were, the zeitgeist of American history, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Right? Even if the factual stuff hasn't changed. Yeah, yeah. So personally, I'm very skeptical of Hollywood and stories, um, and I, I, they would not be my go-to people for, um, you know, conveying a historical narrative or lesson to the general public, uh, you know, given what they do in terms of, I mean, their storytelling techniques are, in my view, uh, kind of antithetical to good history um to say nothing of their orientalism and racism and and all of that and how they created cowboys and they created pirates and they, i mean they like ruined so many periods of history i wouldn't want to entrust them with another one yeah i don't disagree with that yeah. i mean i'm surprised you haven't gone on you know a discussion about byzantium in the various end of rome films yeah, where they're yeah. always very eastern yeah i mean it's, it's the most orientalist of, of it, it is of it things is. but again it, it's it's a useful medium to understand how people think about the past, just as, you know, any writing of history we do is. And I should say, you know, the scientists are no less or more happy than you are when it comes to Hollywood, right? Exactly. You know, the, yes. Yes. The, 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 the you know, the, the most realistic of disease films, right. That came out in the last 20 years is contagion. Um, I don't know if you got on that bandwagon, uh, in March when everyone decided to start watching that on Netflix. No, I had seen it when it came out. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. It and became you, you had a good discussion of that on your podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as the scientist pointed out, right, the vaccine they give people in that is the the person who tries it out, stabs herself in the leg with it with <laughs> a needle, and then they give it out as an inhaler for the rest of the film. And having talked to a virologist, he's very upset about this, right? Now, to me, that was like a stirrups point, right? It's like, right, right. okay, that doesn't matter. It's theatrical you know. Yeah. But still film is more than Hollywood. And um, so if you look on YouTube, there are people who are experimenting with all kinds of visual media in order to convey history, um, you know, from animation to uh, lectures that are done in very interestingly visual ways. Um, and I think for us, that might be a more realistic medium to, and I'm actually thinking of experimenting with something like that myself when I'm done with this history. Yeah, I think one thing that's become interesting in a COVID teaching era, right, is how much is out there for you to use, you being, you know, in a plural sense of teachers, that people can access and can change how they do classroom teaching. And that there are many other ways to do things that you can actually set up. And one thing, you know, I, I know our podcast, I'm sure your podcast has been used for teaching in particular, yeah. right? So, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you don't have to teach a lecture on whatever, you know, 11th century Byzantium. You can listen to Anthony Caldellas talk about his one page version of the 11th century <laughs> right. Byzantium, um, which would be a perfectly good way and use of time. And then you could discuss, you know, particulars of it. So um, Merle, um, Mr. Congressman, we're almost out of time. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to keep. Uh, um, but so last question, is there anything that we can do to the incentive structures in academia to promote, you know, th this kind of outreach, um, more popularizing work? At a short term, no. So much so as academia as a 
tenure track controlled yeah. field yeah, yeah, continues. Yeah. Now, obviously the majority of people aren't tenure track faculty anymore as we know, but yeah. it's still largely controlled by that. So as long as that incentive structure stays, no. But what I do think we can do is push the field in that direction through some of the things we've talked about, which is to say, you still need to probably get out your monograph from your dissertation, get however many articles you need or whatever you need for tenure, but you can use that to do other work at the same time, right? I don't think for the most part, anyone would look down upon, say, if you started a podcast, not when you're a tenured faculty member, but if you'd done it as a an assistant professor, no one would have said this is bad, no. right? And so I think the more and more we incentivize that, the more and more it becomes normalized. And this will take, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, but eventually there becomes a point in which more of this is done. Yeah. And so it's not just, I think, you know, you wait till the end and then you write your big uh, general monograph. There are other things that people are doing. And that comes with training in the short term and these types of changes that I've suggested. Yeah, that's actually like one of the reasons why I started this uh, was because I was I was tempted by the challenge of a new medium, um, having written academic monographs and articles and you know chapters and all that you know enough that, I mean I, I I enjoy doing it I'll continue to do it but, it was not challenging on it's not challenging on the on the medium level, and. And so, because, you know, they're, they're fairly restrictive medium in what you can do, and rightly so. I mean, you know, peer review is both, you know, sometimes it's too strict and not strict enough simultaneously, but whatever. We internalize the rules. Um, whereas in this medium, I felt that, you know, I could, I could uh, fashion this and craft it in the way that I wanted. And I found that interesting and exciting. I think you're right. I mean, right, once you've written enough articles for journals, whether they're in your field or in broader journals, you kind of know the shtick of how to do them, right? Yeah. Same thing, I presume, with monographs. Where, I mean, I don't even know how many monographs you've written, but I'm always blown away by how many. And I assume you have the shtick down, as it were, Yeah. right? There's multi layers. So it's not impossible to learn. And that's why, as I say, I think it's very doable and very learnable. It's just a matter of people being incentivized to stretch themselves a little more. Uh, Merle, it's been great. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on again.